Welcome back, I'm Professor Adam Thompson. And in this EKG case, uh, we've got an 88-year-old male with unexplained diaphoresis. And I posted this case with a little bit of the information on the uh, Paramedicine 101 Facebook page and got a ton of different uh, you know, interpretations, uh, many of which were, were inaccurate. Some people were on the right track. Uh, you got an 88-year-old male. Again, he's got unexplained diaphoresis. And one thing... I want to mention about unexplained diaphoresis. Probably the, the take home point here is that unexplained diaphoresis, meaning there's no reason for them to be sweating. Like they're not outside in 100 degree weather. Uh, they're not actively doing anything. Uh, they're just sitting there at rest sweating in an air conditioned environment. All right. That should make you think cardiac until proven otherwise. So unexplained diaphoresis is cardiac until proven otherwise. Remember that. All right. The patient feels weak, but he's pain free. Uh, he's, you know, slightly more winded than normal whenever he does anything. He, he notices he's got a little bit more dyspnea than he normally would. Uh, and he's, his only history is hypertension and diabetes. Uh, but again, we know diabetics, not only are they at risk for cardiovascular disease, they don't have your typical, uh, you know, pathognomonic uh, presentation. They might present, you know, with shortness of breath. They might present with unexplained diaphoresis. So it's important to remember that those subsects of people, people that have had uh, you know, MIs in the past, or that might have neuropathy due to diabetes, you know, or your postmenopausal or, or, or perimenopausal fe females, they have atypical cardiac presentations. Remember that. All right, so you assess this guy, and of course, it's diaphoretic. Respiration is about 26 per minute. Uh, SpO2 is 95% on room air. Blood pressure, 110 over 68. Heart rate is 78. Glasgow is 15. He's complimented, he's completely alert, answering all your questions appropriately. And again, he's pain free. Um, the only thing here that I might be a little bit concerned about is this blood pressure of 110 over 68 with a history of hypertension. Is that normal for this patient? Because we see a blood pressure of 110 over 68, and it doesn't necessarily set an alarm off, you know, for, for most uh, clinicians. However, if your patient has a history of hypertension, you should f try to figure out what's normal for him. So with the presence of diaphoresis uh, and, you know, a blood pressure that is 110 over 68, uh, this may be uh, hypotension for this patient. So keep that in mind that it, it is all relative. So here we go. Here's the uh, 12 lead EKG that I uh, posted online. And go ahead and take a second um, uh, before I give the solution to it. Pause if you haven't seen it before. Uh, pause the video and take your best guess at what you think is going on. All right, so uh, obviously we're going to you know, be systematic in our approach. We're going to make sure our leads are on correctly, as we always learned. You know, uh, lead one is positive, AVR is negative. And if they are, let's say they were opposite for some reason. Let's say lead one was negative and AVR was positive. You would simply check your limb leads. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're misplaced. It just means that you have some sort of axis deviation. Um, so you should learn about the different types of axis deviation and the pathologies that can cause those. But that's a, a lecture for a different time. So uh, obviously we have, uh, you know, our leads are on correctly here. We have a P wave, a QRS complex that appears narrow, and a T wave, all right? So we have what we think is a sinus rhythm. Uh, the P waves are upright, where they should be. Uh, so we have a, a sinus rhythm. It looks pretty regular. It doesn't look like it has any irregularities or drop beats or anything like that, all right? So I always tell uh, my medics to uh, take a bird's eye view of that EKG, you know, my students when I'm teaching them to interpret 12 EKGs, because there's some things that are going to stand out uh, and even though you want to be systematic in your approach, that bird's eye view gives you the idea of, okay, something serious is going on here. I'm going to be systematic. I'm going to get there, uh, but I'm trying to figure out what is causing that change. So if you did that with this 12 EDKG, if you kind of did that, you know, uh, sky view or that bird's eye view and looked at the whole thing real quickly, what stands out? And what most of you are probably going to tell me is V1 through V3. It looks different. It almost looks like a widened QRS. But that doesn't make any sense because we started with a narrow QRS with P waves, uh, and, and the rhythm doesn't look to have changed. So why do we have a, a widened QRS here? Well, what if I told you that QRS complex is not wide? Let's zoom in on it, okay? Even though you're saying, hey, Adam, it, it's definitely wide. Uh, if, you, if you start the QRS there and end it there, uh, it looks pretty dang wide. And it would if that were all the QRS complex. That isn't the QRS complex, though, all right? Uh, the QRS complex is the same width as this one over here, all right? So it starts about here, and it probably ends 
let's say right about there. So what's all this? What's all this part of that? That's ST segment depression. That is ST segment depression that looks like a widened QRS complex, okay? You can even see where it kind of steps off right there, and that's probably our J point, similar to right there. All right, so that's ST segment depression, and, and it comes up right into that T wave, all right? So you have ST segment depression in V1, in V2, in V3. Over here, you see it in V4 as well, okay? And maybe even a little bit in V5. And I'd say probably that might be ST segment depression right there in V6 as well. So what is this ST segment depression indicating to us? All right, well, there's a couple things that can cause ST segment depression. Um, and, and one of those would be, you know, uh, uh, subendocardial ischemia. Remember, ischemia doesn't localize, so that would be across the whole 12 EDKG. Maybe V1 might be elevated, AVR, and, and maybe even AVL, but most of the 12 leads would have some ST segment depression. And that goes for LMCA stenosis or three vessel disease, or sometimes called triple vessel disease, same thing. Um, it goes for all of those. So it, it's not that. In fact, this is, this is a reciprocal change. That's the other possibility when it comes to ST segment depression, is a, a, a reciprocal change of some other area being infarcted. All right? So think about, especially these leads, okay? V1, V2, uh, and even V3. Think about those leads. What would those be reciprocal to? All right, and what you might normally see with this pattern would be an inferior wall MI, uh, which could be coming. Uh, that's because typically this is a posterior wall MI. When you see these reciprocal changes in leads V1, V2, and V3, all right, the ST segment depression, you typically do see it with an inferior wall MI, but it is reciprocal to the posterior wall. In fact, this 12 lead monitor is so good now on a clean tracing that it actually saw the posterior infarct all right and that's not what i am basing my interpretation of this 12 lead on the patient did go to the cath lab and, and in fact did have an occlusion involving the posterior descending artery what you would normally see with a posterior wall mi is inferior wall changes as well uh, because by that time that you get to the patient they've had the uh, infarct for a little while and it's typically a dominant rca or the right coronary artery wraps around and provides blood flow to that posterior descending artery so you would see an inferior wall mi as well and you don't need to to do a posterior 12 lead to call stemi at that point but in this case where you only see these reciprocal changes and you don't see any st segment elevation on this 12 lead it would be indicated to do a posterior 12 lead to uh, have your diagnostic criteria to call a STEMI alert and get the patient expeditious care at the PCI center. And that was, in fact, what happened for this patient. Now, uh, they didn't get a posterior 12 lead, but because the medic identified that it said STEMI on the 12 lead, it's a pretty clean tracing, all right? So there's no reason for this 12 lead to misinterpret a STEMI. Uh, the, the, the medic sent that 12 lead over to the receiving facility uh, and the ER physician activated the cath lab based on this 12 lead. And here's the next 12 lead EKG for that same patient. And this one it's kind of, you know, a lot more clear that this is in fact ST segment depression here because you have a more acute change. It kind of identifies the J point a little bit easier, but this is all ST segment depression, um, which makes the other one a lot you know, easier to interpret as well. If you were to look at this, you'd say, oh, okay, they're evolving. You know, it's, it's a obviously ST segment depression. Um, and, and, and this is a reciprocal change, again, to the posterior wall. So this patient is infarcting. I know when you first learn 12 EDKGs, you learn, well, ST segment, you know, uh, it, it's dynamic. And when somebody has an infarct, first they'll have ischemia and they have depression. And then they'll have injury and they'll have some elevation and then they'll develop a Q wave after infarct has lasted for a while. And that's sort of true, uh, but it doesn't happen in like a localized fashion like a STEMI is, you know. So, for instance, if we were talking about leads 2, 3, and AVF for an inferior wall a STEMI, they wouldn't necessarily present with ST segment depression first in 2, 3, and AVF, and then elevation, right? Uh, the, the ischemia does not localize. So what that means is, that when they're ischemic, the subendocardial ischemia, it presents in several leads. It doesn't necessarily present any localized leads. Um, and a lot of times we call that a STEMI equivalent. 
All right, so when you see ST segment depression like this, you should look and see, is this a, a localized thing? And it is, so that's probably a reciprocal change. Whenever you see localized ST segment depression, especially to this degree, um, in a patient that's got a cardiac presentation, you should think it's probably a reciprocal change. And one trick that you may have learned if you took a 12-week you know, class uh, you know, more recently is that you can take V1 and V2 and, and even V3 in this case and kind of flip it and look at it through the back of the EKG if you held it up to the light. Uh, and then you would see that posteriorly uh, you have ST segment elevation, right? And that's what I did here. And obviously now since I flipped it, V1 ends up on the bottom, uh, V2 stays in the middle, and V3 ends up on top. Uh, but you do see that ST segment elevation that way. But that is not, uh, you know, uh, going to replace the criteria within your guidelines. If you have criteria in your guidelines similar to what the AHA prescribes that says ST segment elevation of at least one millimeter and two contiguous leads, this traditional 12 lead did not meet that criteria, even though the patient has, is having a significant infarct. That is why we would recommend doing a posterior 12 lead EKG. So you, then you would have that criteria met. You know, you would do posterior leads, and what you take do is you take uh, leads V4, V5, and V6, and you kind of just continue a around to the back from where V6 was. Um, you stay in that same, like, lateral plane, and you go around to the back, and you move V4 to what would now be V7, which is the posterior axillary line on that same plane. Uh, V5 will become V8, which is the mid-scapular line, and you would want to palpate the scap scapula. And one easy way of doing that is uh, have the patient kind of lift their arm, that left arm, as you palpate right there. And you can feel the shoulder blade underneath there, which is the scapula. So place V8 below that bone. And you're simply doing that to, to get a nice clean tracing because the further you put the electrodes away from the heart, the, you know, the lower the voltage and you know, the harder it is to interpret. And then V9 is going to go paraspinal, just uh, medial to V8. And make sure you change it on the printout. If you print out a, a posterior 12 lead, change V4, V5, and V6 to V7, V8, and V9 on the actual printout so it doesn't get confused. Let me just take a quick second to explain that posterior anatomy. So here uh, on the left here is that's our anterior view. And that's kind of what you're used to seeing uh, when you look at these heart diagrams. You have your right coronary artery that comes down here. This is called the coronary sulcus between the right atrium and the right ventricle. All right, and that goes around to the back of the heart. It comes around this way. And it generally, in 85% of people, so most people, it's going to provide blood flow to this posterior descending artery. So typically what would happen is somebody has a right coronary artery occlusion. Um, you know, let's say it's somewhere right here. Okay, that's pretty significant uh, right coronary artery occlusion. What would happen is first, the, the furthest part, you know, the furthest uh, part of that coronary vessel or the last place to get blood flow from that coronary artery is the first place to start dying, all right? So what would happen is you get that right coronary artery occlusion over here, and the posterior wall is the last place to receive blood flow, so that might be your first place to start getting ischemia, all right? So you might get ischemic changes, but generally, in most people, by the time we get to them, uh, this area, this inferior wall, has already started becoming ischemic and injured, and we can diagnose an, an inferior wall STEMI pretty easily based on that. However, Let's say, you know, it was a more distal uh, occlusion. Let's say it was here, uh, which is past that marginal branch, or here, which is close to the posterior descending artery. Um, in that case, you may only have posterior wall changes, and that would be a good indication to get that posterior 12 lead. And again, expedite the patient care, because time is tissue or time is muscle, whatever you've heard is true. Uh, the, the shorter period of time to reperfusion, the more muscle is being saved, the lower their chances of having severe, you know, heart failure with low ejection fractions and better quality of life and all of that stuff is true. Um, so we really do make a difference in those cases. And by acquiring a posterior 12 lead and activating the cath lab early on, uh, you may uh, improve this patient's overall care.